so we'll move on to the next uh, session, uh, which is basically case vignettes in onconephrology. The moderator will be Dr. Sanjeev Nair. The panelists are Dr. Gagan Prakash and Dr. Rajiv Rajiva and Dr. Mayuri Trivedi. The chairpersons are Dr. Manish Rati from Chandigarh, Dr. Dipinka Bhomik from Delhi, Dr. Anand Chalapan from Nagpur, and Dr. Dhananjay from Nagpur, and Dr. Ambike from Pune. Dr. Dhananjay Ukalkar. Shut up. Wait for the chairs to get to the chairs. Uh, good evening, everyone. So before we start off this session, I have a couple of caveats that I'd like to point out. One, uh, when we set this uh, panel discussion up, one of the reasons that we did it was uh, not because all of us have a lot of expertise in onconephrology, it's just that we, were, we found ourselves working in uh, oncology and oncology-related cases and uh, faced a lot of difficulty and then realized that this is a topic that's not really discussed and covered in our conferences and meetings. And we think that this kind of a panel might help trigger future conferences, uh, especially society conferences, from taking this up in a much bigger way, one. Two, when we planned it, we had planned for uh, to address one of the things that uh, Professor Sribhushan Raju was just saying, that patients in oncology should leave oncology and come to us. Uh, we are hoping, we were hoping at least, that uh, we could set off a conversation here where um, oncology and nephrology don't need to be existing in silos and effectively going forward they probably will not be uh, and there'll be a lot more crosstalk between the two specialties. And we wanted to set it up in a way where we had a medical oncologist, uh, a surgical oncologist and two nephrologists sharing their experience. Unfortunately, Dr. Vashish Maniar uh, had a medical emergency and is not available. So uh, we will not be giving you an onco-nephro uh, facet of the discussion, but there will be a nephro-onco definitely to whatever extent that we can. Uh, the last is that um, to the chairpersons, the two of these panelists are waiting to finish and run away. So time management uh, is of uh, utmost importance. Uh, that said, let's start off. So we have what we thought we'd do is have some case vignettes which will highlight uh, challenges that we faced in management and uh, we'll go through the cases. There are no diagnostic difficulties here, it's just the management and what takeaway points we wanted to highlight. So case one was a 62-year-old diabetic salesman who presented with a history of gross painless hematuria since four months and had these CT images done uh, elsewhere three days back. We can clearly see that there are, yeah, yeah, that there are, uh, there's bilateral HUN and there is a bladder uh, mass. So the urine cytology was positive for a high-grade urothelial malignancy. Uh, renal functions were raised, uh, uh, and uh, the, there was borderline hyperkalemia. Now, this patient may have, obviously, an obstructive uh, nephropathy, but there is also a contrast-induced nephropathy. An initial diagnosis of muscle-invasive bladder, bladder cancer with obstructive uh, uropathy was made. So my first question uh, for Dr. Mayuri is, how do you decide the choice of imaging in cancer patients with borderline GFR? Uh, here, the uh, imaging is not only going to be necessary for the diagnosis, but it is also going to be necessary for planning the further treatment. So the patient right now does have an element of acute kidney injury. So what we can do is we can uh, uh, calculate the Mehran score, though that is not the best for the CT because the Mehran score is essentially for the PCI. And uh, if the imaging is what is going to decide what the further treatment is, I think we may have to bite the bullet and go ahead with a, a contrast uh, enhanced CT scan. Uh, I'm not too sure, maybe the surgeon amongst us, uh, Dr. Gagan, can enlighten us whether an, a plain MRI could uh, kind of replace a C C CT there. Uh, yeah. Uh, so essentially, we would we are more interested to see that with this kind of a apparently locally advanced mass and hydronephrosis. The moment there is hydronephrosis, we know that this kind of a tumor has the potential to have a metastatic disease. And uh, what we very often in practice do is do an FDG PET without contrast, because many of these patients actually present with obstructive uropathy, and uh, we are not able to give contrast. And uh, 
plain MRI, yes, uh, is an option. Uh, the, that option is more so reserved if we have uh, concerns about the technicality of safety of uh, doing the resection, as in you know, uh, the local planes with the rectum and whether this patient is going to land up into a pelvic excentration instead of a cystectomy. Those information are better uh, met with uh, the local MRI. <clears throat> So that is uh, precisely what was done, an FDG PET was done in this patient and it confirmed the absence of metastatic disease. Uh, so to Gagan, what is the choice then of uh, urinary reversion that you would mm -hmm. prefer generally? Yeah, so uh, typically there are ileal conduits and neobladders which are uh, offered to the patients uh, after a cystectomy. There used to be a lot of other diversions using the large bowel and fancy pouches which have been given away. Uh, it's just that the types of neobladders uh, today are at least three or four, and an ileal conduit is a very standard one. Um, in this patient, which has already presented with a raised creatinine and uh, possibly a borderline, or possibly a baseline CKD, one would want to avoid the neobladder because of the various uh, known uh, uh, ill effects and consequences on the renal function. Uh, it's it's almost like a contraindication uh, beyond uh, uh, you know uh, certain GFR that we would not want to do a GF uh, uh, and a new bladder. So probably ileal conduit in this patient would be the suitable choice. Yeah. Right. So this patient uh, had a bilateral PCN placed, and then the uh, creatinine dropped down to 1.8 after around two weeks. Uh, so again, again, this was actually we were planning to direct it to. Uh, Dr. Vashisht, but Gagan, <clears throat> do you have uh, any comments on what the concerns are in giving <clears throat> chemotherapy to a patient who has PCN and DGS-10 in situ? Yes, uh, Sanjeev, so this is um, a day-to-day -day problem that we are facing without a solution and the problem uh, got all the more prominent during the COVID when close to 50% of our patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer were actually presenting with obstructive uropathy. I mean, that was a global phenomenon during the pandemic and we saw it all the more in, in Tata. Now, uh, whereas a nephrostomy would be uh, the fastest way to get these kidney obstruct, uh, un unobstructed, deobstructed, and also the more easier or more definitive diversions because with that tumor sitting over there, a retrograde DJ sinting is almost never uh, possible in these patients. One could think of doing a nephrostomy and starting the chemotherapy on that, or one could think of doing a nephrostomy, doing an anti-grade stinting, removing the PCNs, and then uh, continuing the chemotherapy on the DJ stents. Now, what we've seen practically in Tata very often is that the patients who've been uh, uh, internalized, the stents have been internalized and have DJ stents, more uh, chances, you know, they have more chances of uh, landing into UTIs and urosepsis and the whole febrile neutropenia cycle when they are on chemotherapy. So we generally prefer to have an external drainage when these patients are to be receiving chemotherapy. But of course the external drainage have their own set of problems and you know a lot of times they were nephrostomies would di dislodge and you have to reinsert them and those uh, issues are there. Um, interestingly, we actually looked at the, the set of patients who went through this pathway of some kind of a diversion and then tried to give chemotherapy, uh, which because new adjuvant chemotherapy is the standard of care, versus the set of patients in which we said that let's not do all this, let's get the bladder out first because that will be the best way to deobstruct these ureters and maybe then give adjuvant chemotherapy to these set of patients. And uh, what we sound this, which is uh, now a published uh, literature, is that those receiving adjuvant chemotherapy after an upfront cystectomy were uh, faring equally well, actually. So that, that might be a pathway to be explored in our scenarios, I mean, our kind of patients where we see a lot of obstructive uropathy. Uh, do you have any comment on what the cutoff for cisplatin ineligibility in these patients are? Yeah, so uh, different actually, but I mean there are various criteria for uh, cisplatin ineligibility, including sensitivity hearing loss and the, uh, the age. And uh, but in in terms of the GFR, I think it's 40 is what is being uh, considered here yeah, yeah, for cisplatin. And of course, for carboplatin, it is more liberal. So it's just that the carboplatin efficiency in the new adjuvant setting has not been found to be as good as cisplatin. So it is generally not given. I mean, there are a lot of institutes who would never consider carboplatin, but uh, there are some centers who would want to give something rather than not giving any form of chemotherapy. Yeah. 
Um, I know that uh, this is platinum carbon platinum debate was uh, held in the morning when Dr. Shruti Gupta spoke. But what is your uh, experience, Mayuri, using carbon platinum with regards to renal? Uh, damage. So definitely when it comes to uh, choosing between cisplatin and carboplatin, carboplatin uh, it isn't that it does not have an uh, element of AKI but uh, it's definitely lesser than cisplatin. All right. So again, like uh, Dr. Gagan just discussed, we, there was an upfront radical cystectomy with an ileal conduit done for this patient. Surgery was uneventful and the patient after some time post-surgery had a uh, rise, in crea rise in creatinine. So it went up from 2.1 on post-op day 1 to 2.6 on post-op day 2 with a slight decrease in uh, urine output. So Mayuri, what do you think is happening here and uh, how do we approach this? Uh, one is definitely the creat started worsening post-operatively, so we need to look for the uh, whatever was the insult that was intraoperatively. Uh, the, the fluid balance would be one thing that I would really want to look at. How much was the blood loss? How much was replaced? Were there any uh, hypotensive episodes during uh, intraoperatively or post? I would want to look for sepsis here and uh, drug dosing, ab absolutely we need to know what the... So these are drugs beyond the chemo drugs, whatever the antibiotics then Alja 6, whatever is required. So we need to know what the ongoing GFR at that point of time is and then uh, dose accordingly. And fluid therapy, I don't think it would be really different for somebody who is having a malignancy as compared to someone who's not. But if we require a large volume fluid resuscitation, again, our rules where, you know, you look out for hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and if it's going to be large uh, volume resuscitation, you know, prefer balanced salt solutions as compared to a normal saline. And uh, these would be the broad, uh, broad I mean, the, yeah, the outline for fluid management here. Okay, so this patient was finally discharged on post day 13 with a creatinine of 1.8 and had an output of 1.4 liters per day. So this is a patient with now some degree of renal insufficiency uh, and ileal conduit in place. Uh, and Rajiva, what are the diet modifications during this period and considering that this patient now has to undergo chemotherapy, uh, what do you think would be the diet modifications? Yeah, so uh, this is a patient with now CKD probably CKD stage 3 to 4 because this is a patient with malignancy with probably a very low muscle mass and uh, also has an ileal conduit in place. Not working. And also an ileal conduit in place. So one of the challenges that uh, we face in these patients is uh, with an ileal conduit in place is diarrhea. So diarrhea can be a serious and a very irritating issue in these patients. Uh, um, and uh, they have a multiple abnormalities, some ab metabolic abnormalities like uh, uh, hypokalemia, severe metabolic acidosis, uh, much more than the level of CKD that they are in, uh, vitamin deficiencies, diet, like vitamin B12 deficiency. Also, uh, the bile salts, etc. are not absorbed, so they have a chronic diarrhea which is continuing. So they can be chronically dehydrated uh, and uh, they come with multiple episodes of AKI uh, on a pre-existing CKD. And with the ileal cordial place, again, urinary infection is the other aspect we have to consider when we prescribe a diet to these patients. So the first thing is correcting the acidosis, which can be challenging in most of these cases. Um, correction of hypokalemia. So the diarrhea may also have to be controlled with a fiber-rich diet. Uh, sometimes cholestyramine can be prescribed up to a certain extent. Again, a certain amount of flatulence and uh, inability to eat is present in these patients. Um, and uh, considering this, the other is the protein. Um, so in these patients with a fairly catabolic state, so they may require a slightly higher amount of protein. So actually there are... Uh, I mean, when I dug into a bit of uh, reading, there's actually not much guidelines in managing such patients with AKI in uh, oncological, uh, you know, um, scenarios. Because these are definitely more challenging than a simple or just CKD alone. So uh, this is one of the things. So around 1 to 1.2 gram per kg of, per day of protein may be required. At the same time, balancing the diarrhea and other things may be actually a challenge. Uh, Sanjeev, can I just add something? So, you know, from a practical point of view, actually, this is a huge concern for us in the surgical uh, side because these are patients who've been having this obstructive uropathy, probably urosepsis, malnourished. They've had a surgery which has required 
three kinds of anastomosis, the bowel anastomosis, the uretric anastomosis, and then we have our concerns of all the anastomotic leaps in the post-operative period. And that is where, uh, you know, uh, somebody with a, a borderline GFR and, you know, what kinds of protein restriction we, I mean, we, we feel that probably a nephrologist role in this scenario is, uh, would be crucial, actually. So, again, we are actually now advocating a higher protein uh, intake than what we would normally prescribe a CKD patient. So this is one of the things that we'll have to unlearn when we're treating these patients. Uh, so okay, follow up uh, after two years with the bilateral, uh, he presented again with the bilateral uh, HUN and a creatinine of 6.2. Uh, the bilateral PCN internalization was done, an adult creatinine was 3.2. Uh, on USG liver, there was a two, three into two centimeter lesion, which is a query METS. Again, what's happening here? What's the cause of a new onset uh, hydronephrosis at this point? So, typically it's time uh, based. You know? So, most of the uh, hydronephrosis either worsening or a new onset hydronephrosis that develops after a urinary diversion within the first 18 months, like 12 months to 18 months or so, are because of a surgical cause. So, there's been an ischemia of the ureter which has been anastomosis, and there's a stenosis which has uh, gradually led to the worsening of uh, these. In fact, there are actually centers uh, and what happens is that these patients are often on three or six monthly follow-ups after their uh, diversion has been done. So, uh, there is a possibility that you might miss that surgically created obstruction and you might realize it by the time the GFR is already significantly fallen. So, there are actually centers which routinely perform a renogram at baseline before a cystectomy and at uh, the first follow-up so as to pick up a very early uh, obstructive component which is there, otherwise you might end up losing one of these kidneys. Typically, uh, uh, if the hydronephrosis is seen after 18 months or around 2 years or more than that or essentially long-term follow-up hydronephrosis, one should very strongly suspect that there is a recurrence over there. And in this patient, it kind of fits because he's probably had a recurrence at the urethroallial junction. Uh, urethelial cancers, as we know, has a field change, so they can recur in any part of the urethelium. And uh, they, they, they would, you know, sometimes recur at these urethric anastomoses and uh, often uh, have a distant metastasis uh, like in this patient. So, this, uh, this case should ideally highlight the degree of uh, coordination that goes on between urology, uro-oncology, nephrology, uh, medical oncology and probably radiation oncology as well to manage uh, a patient like this. Obviously, this case will go on for some time, but uh, this patient's ordeal will go on for some time, but we'll move on to our uh, next case. Uh, case two is a 34-year-old male with a history of hypothyroidism who presented in November 2013 with a right flank pain for the last three months. Uh, there was a CT abdomen and the CT abdomen showed this heterogeneous mass, uh, uh, hypertense mass. Uh, involving the upper and mid region of the right kidney um, and there was no ev evidence of hydronephrosis or hydroureter. The lung bases are clear. So a diagnosis of RCC was made. This patient underwent a right radical nephrectomy and it was staged surgically as T4N0M0. So Gagan, uh, is there a role for nephron sp sparing surgery in this case? Uh Technically, I would, um, I mean, so the things that I would want to know is his age, uh, the, the split function of the other kidney, and a very, very detailed uh, imaging study, actually. I mean, to the extent that now we've started doing uh, 3D models of these tumors. Uh, just because we have moved from a point where uh, partial nephrectomies were limited to T1As or T1Bs, or, you know, as, as we call very laddu kind of tumors, you know, which can be really easily resected. Uh, very, very complex partial nephrectomies can be performed if this is a younger patient or if this patient has a borderline GFR or risk factors or if the other kidney is uh, at risk. So, uh, by the description of the CT scan, I think it will be difficult. Also, by a T4 stage, oncologically, it may not be very safe to do a partial nephrectomy in this patient. But if the need arises, then these are the things that one would want to consider uh, for the, you know, the technical aspect of or the feasibility of uh, having a partial nephrectomy. Yeah, so I think the take. Right, right. Sir. So what has happened is that uh, there is a concept called as the contact surface area now. Now, imagine a five centimeter tumor which is totally endophytic right bang into the hilum 
versus a 11 centimeter tumor or maybe a bosnaic 4 kind of a tumor which is just you know attached to the kidney at the lower pole so that is where the contact surface area comes so if this is like in the, the second scenario where there's an 11 centimeter masses which is small contact surface area irrespective of the 11 centimeter size should be a very straightforward partial nephrectomy whereas the 4 centimeter endophytic tumor might be a problem because the contact surface area is like a 360 degrees for that one i think the takeaway from that is that we don't need to do a i mean we shouldn't automatically go for a full nephrectomy and talk to maybe somebody at tmh before uh, okay so the histopathology gear came back as this high grade renal cell carcinoma with a high chance of recurrence so they they've added a g3 which is a high chance of recurrence uh, and in follow up uh, in march 2015 uh, this patient presented with what is effectively matched to uh, D9 and L3 and he received uh, radiation, uh, received palliative radiotherapy. So the patient was thereafter started on multi-kinase inhibitor sorafenib uh, between April 15 and December 2022. Uh, sorafenib was stopped in December 2022 because he had a CT scan which showed a new onset skeletal uh, retroperitoneal and common iliac adenopathy and stable skeletal mats. And he was planned for changing sorafenib to sunitinib. At this point, a routine workup showed that he had an adult onset proper nephrotic syndrome with 24 hour protein, uh, proteinuria revealing 7 grams of protein with hyperlipidemia. So, what can be the causes of proteinuria at this stage, um, Sajiva? So, uh, this is a high risk RCC which has progressed to a metastatic disease which has failed uh, one TKI and gone on to the second TKI. So, um, I think one of the things which I would put top on the list is, uh, is it a secondary sort of a nephrotic syndrome where uh, we're seeing something like, like a membranous or a FSGS or a minimal change disease. Um, the second would be a TKI induced proteinuria, which is, which uh, I mean, through the talks to the day we have seen is very common and does, uh, and as one of the panelists had said, can resolve with a, a stoppage of the drug, which would be actually quite difficult in this patient who is already in a metastatic uh, stage. Um, and the third probably would be that uh, this person has had a um, nephrectomy. So is it like a, um, 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 you know, a hyperfiltration injury? Little less likely because the proteinuria is nephrotic range. Uh, and the fourth would be probably a paraneoplastic manifestation of uh, the, uh, the cancer itself because of recurrence. So all of these things to be considered. Uh, Mayuri, what is the role of a renal biopsy in this case and what are the challenges given that there's just the one kidney? The, uh, Mike, you working? Doctor? Obviously, the challenge being that it is a single kidney and we are going to be a little more careful about biopsying these patients. Uh, though, uh, maybe uh, we wouldn't be wrong if we actually ask for an open uh, wedge biopsy because it's a kidney biopsy. But I think with the current advances in uh, the, the USG and the safety of the uh, device that we use, maybe we can go with a guarded, uh, a normal uh, uh, sono-guided biopsy also. Now, the renal biopsy, as we see here, that the, the differential of protein urea here is is very vast uh, less likely in this particular case less likely for it to be hyperfiltration causing this uh, you know this amount of protein urea but again we cannot deny the presence of an underlying hyperfiltration injury because you know he has a single kidney from 2013 for the last 10 years he has a single kidney so there would be some amount of that but so, if I had to just put it in a nutshell, it is not only for diagnosis, but also for prognosis of proteinuria for this patient who has a single kidney. So, the renal biopsy was done. It showed 12 gloms uh, with mild increase in glomerular size, no glomerular sclerosis, so focal sclerosis. Uh, the, the tubule showed hyperfiltration injury and the vessels show minimal intimal hyperplasia. The IF was negative. Is this enough for you, Mayuri? I, Sajiv, sorry. can I just interrupt? So, uh, when we are operating on these patients with a borderline GFR, which with an aggressive tumor, which we often know based on the radiology and other things, do you think it will make sense that the nephrectomy specimen biopsy is also sent as like a baseline or we would only want it when the progression happens? Yeah. So, 
So for that, I mean, I think uh, all nephrologists would be pleased if there is a GFR which is borderline and you are giving us a histopath diagnosis at that point of time. I think it makes sense because we would then come to know what the native kidney disease is and why the patient to begin with has a low GFR and we would be able to prognosticate him better because henceforth he's going to be on a single kidney. So definitely if you that specimen can go for a renal biopsy would make sense. Now uh, here again, as you said, the renal biopsy for me, definite, we would expect hyperfiltration injury because he's been with a single kidney for so long, but this does not make me wiser. So this, this picture could be uh, just a picture of MCD because the gloms appear to be normal and it is, you know, uh, there is 7 grams of proteinuria. We are missing the underlying podocytopathy over here, which could be either a paraneoplastic glomerular so disease or the, so we, we definitely need an EM here. So the EM was suggestive of moderate food process effacement involving 50% of the area and hyperfiltration injury with lipid droplets. Can I just send it up? Yeah. So to answer Dr. Gagan's question, so we had a, we had a patient uh, who um, had a underlying diabetes who developed RCC and uh, there was an nephrectomy done and actually the entire specimen was done uh, sent. So obviously when we do look at a report in a malignancy, we only look at what is the staging. But then when we read the report more carefully, the pathologist had actually reported on the non-malignant area as a diabetic nephropathy. So after this, the patient has a proteinuria, we still know that, uh, you know, there is an underlying renal disease. So yeah, so it makes sense for you to send the whole my and really and tell them to look beyond the malignancy. Yeah, mm -hmm. beyond the malignancy. Yeah. Do an IF problem. My, well, how do you manage this proteinuria now? Whom are you asking? So uh, here again, uh, with the EF showing uh, the hyperfiltration injury in the background and the podocytopathy, again, we are not wiser whether this is, uh, you know, just a de novo uh, minimal change disease or is it a para uh, neoplastic glomerular disease because the patient does have a recurrence also on the PET scan. We won't be very wrong in giving this patient steroids because that is going to treat both a primary as well as a secondary, uh, uh, the cause of the secondary nephrotic syndrome. There is no way that I know and I would, you know, keep this question open to my uh, audience is that is there any way at this point of time whether we can predict whether this is a paraneoplastic glomerular disease or it is an MCD which is de novo. I, I am not too sure we have biomarkers that are going to make us maybe antinephrin to an extent once it's available commercially. So Manish or if you want to. I think to. the effacement was not uh, more than 80%, it was just 50%. Possibly, possibly it's just an FSGS which was. The effacement of food processes was just 50 percent, so I doubt it's MCD. So it could just be a uh, FSGS, which is secondary to the. Uh, uh, I, I doubt it's an MCD kind of pattern. Which no, okay, is so not even the MCD. Let's say it's a pattern. That's what I think FSGS, we can judge from the EM and uh, in the absence of any other marker. Yeah, so that's it's. it's so I think uh, you are right. It is very difficult to say whether it is primary, primary. or secondary. Uh, there is food process effacement, which classically speaking should not happen in secondary. There is hypoalbuminemia, which is again classically speaking should not happen in secondary FSGS. These are the two things which point toward that this is something primary. Now primary, whether it is paraneoplastic kind of thing, again that will come not typically in a secondary FSGS, which is a kind of hyperfiltration secondary FSGS. Yeah. Uh, and I would personally agree that we may, we may try to give him steroids to decrease and, and the proteinuria. other thing here is that the patient was on sorafenib so sorafenib does inhibit vgf and vgf itself can cause a podocytopathy kind of picture on uh, the uh, uh, biopsy and again we are going we may not be able to give him this uh, sonatinib for yeah, so sure. the proteinuria here would effectively be multifactor multifactor yeah uh, treatment options for this malignancy gagan do you want to take that yeah, so uh, I think in the last uh, in the last uh, half a decade, there's been like uh, so many options, but broadly they are like TKIs, immunotherapy, and a combination of dual TKIs, TKI with immunotherapy, a combination of dual immunotherapies as well. I think it uh, would largely depend on how deep the patient's pockets are and uh, what kind of malignancy they are. But yeah, we have at least like second and third line, both for clear cells and uh, non-clear cells, uh, which would be there. All right. Um, Rajiva, which are the 
cancer drugs treatment armamentarium which can contribute to proteinuria? So I think. Just use yeah, the one mic that seems to be working. So I think the uh, the range of all the drugs uh, which can cause the proteinuria is uh, so it can all the uh, possible known classes of drugs. If you could just show the slide, so all the possible known classes of drugs can cause proteinuria. I think uh, the uh, in our particular case we were I think discussing uh, uh, TKIs uh, which are known to cause uh, both MCD as well as FSGS. Uh, we have the uh, even the desantinib imatinib group of drugs again uh, known to cause CKD as well as FSGS MCD type of lesions. Again, uh, very difficult as Mayuri said to differentiate between a primary versus a drug induced versus a, a tubular interstitial disease. Many of the mechanisms for uh, the uh, proteinuria in these groups of drugs is actually quite unknown. Uh, so um, the almost. Uh, when I look through literature, almost everything can actually cause Putin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think uh, on on that note, uh, we can move on to thir the third case and hopefully last case that we'll discuss today. So this is a 29-year-old female, non-diabetic, non-hypertensive, uh, had a biopsy proven uh, CTIN and and was on peritoneal dialysis for two years and underwent a live-related kidney transplant in April 2019. Her mother was the donor. Uh, the CMV status was D plus R plus and the EBV status was D plus R minus. A pre-op CT chest and abdomen was normal, the CDC cross match was negative, DSA singly antigen B was negative, patient received basiliximab as induction. The immediate post-transplant timeline looked like this, there was a good graft function and the patient was uh, discharged with a creatinine of 0.8, uh, standard triple immunosuppression with prednisolone, MMF and tracrylamus. A month later, uh, there was a steroid resistant uh, acute cellular rejection which was treated with thymoglobulin at 2 milligrams per kg, single dose. Uh, the creatinine returned to 0.6. Two months later, there was an obstructive lymphocele which was drained and the patient was doing fairly okay after the second month post-transplant with a creatinine of around 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Nine months after, the, after this, the patient complains of unexplained, unexplained fatigue, anger and behavioral issues on and off vertigo lasting a few minutes. The physical examination uh, was normal, normal BP, normal heart rate. Fundus was normal. The labs were relatively normal. Chest X-ray, ENT, consult was normal. CT brain without a contrast was normal. A week later, because the patient uh, kept worsening, an MRI was done. Uh, axial and coronal imaging and TV-weighted post-contrast image shows uh, multifocal periventricular ring enhancing lesion in the bilateral frontal lobes. Serum, EBV, DNA and toxoplasma were negative. Okay. Uh, so the further investigation showed that a patient had a CD20 positive monomorphic B-cell post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder with the presence of EBV. A CSF analysis was done which showed EBV viral load of around 44,000 copies per ml, whereas the repeat PCR on the peripheral blood remained negative. A PET CT uh, showed no other foci of metabolically active disease anywhere else in the body, with uptake only in the peri periventricular lesions. So, what are the risk factors for PTLD, Mayuri? So, my slide. So, uh, obviously, I mean, all of us sitting here know that viral positivity, most commonly the virus that's been defined is the EBV. Uh, apart from the EBV, there have been increased chances of PTLD in patients with uh, a CMV as well as HHV8. Uh, a immunosuppressive, uh, 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 immunosuppression regimen that is intense, especially the T-cell depleting agents, Belatacept, and uh, even MMF to a large extent has been known to be associated with a higher incidence of PTLD. It is seen more commonly in males and in the, uh, racially in the Caucasians at extremes of age. So children and the elderly are the ones who are most uh, commonly affected by PTLD. Uh, if I may put it that way, thankfully for us, kidney transplant is a low risk for PTLD as compared to the other solid organ uh, uh, transplants. And higher the degree of an SLA, uh, HLA mismatch, higher is the chances that this patient may develop a uh, PTLD in future. And uh, essentially, there have been case reports and anecdotal data that a certain type of HLA positivity in the recipient may predispose him to uh, a higher chance of developing this uh, disorder later in the uh, the soft transplant. So our patient clearly had uh, two of these risk factors, EBV naive status as well as she's received hemoglobin. Um, so 
like like my research said more than 80 percent of pteld is ebv related rajiva you want to talk about the pathophysiology of uh, what contributes to so to some extent uh, we know uh, the pathophysiology ebv uh, naive recipients so basically uh, ebv becomes immortalized in the b cells and uh, in a immunocompetent patient it basically does not cause much harm but once we immunosuppress the patient, the cytotoxic T cell uh, also gets suppressed and therefore there is an unchecked proliferation of the B cells. And this is essentially uh, uh, leads to the um, malignant transformation of these cells and leads to PTLD. In EBV negative PTLD, however, we don't have that much of data about the pathogenesis and uh, most likely it is due to the chronic antigenic stimulation and infection with other viruses. In fact, CMV D, D plus R minus status are seven times higher and more likely to have uh, PTLD than the uh, CMV D plus. PTLD. Yeah, EBV negative PTLD uh, when compared to the uh, um, uh, CMV D plus R plus group of patients. Okay, so what we did after this, we discontinued the MMF and tacrolimus. We started her on a regimen consisting of rituximab, zirovudine, gancyclovir, and dexamethasone. This was given for six months. Um, the, PET, the PET CT at three months showed no new evidence of lesions. The CSF at six months was EBV negative. And a PET CT after one year is also negative for malignancy. So what happened next? The patient is back on dialysis because we stopped all the immunosuppression. There was an enterohemorrhagic E. coli sepsis in late 2020 and a severe COVID infection after that in 2021 requiring ventilation, steroids and remdesivir. Uh, and EV fistula thrombosis and stenosis then followed which was successfully managed with thrombolysis and balloon dilatation in 21. And right now she is on thrice weekly dialysis but her PET CT uh, even in the last month was normal. Uh, so the Rajiva, what are the treatment strategies for EBV positive and EBV negative PTLD? So in this particular uh, lady, when we uh, encountered her, first of all, her symptoms were pretty uh, uh, kind of uh, very difficult to diagnose the PTLD itself. Even though we knew she was EBV naive, the only thing that she came with, or rather the family complaint was that she was getting angry more often, which on retrospect, looking at the frontal lobe CNS restricted disease, was fairly explainable. Uh, after this, uh, the other uh, problem that we had was, um, uh, so we sent her to the medical oncologist and uh, there was a kind of a debate whether we should irradiate, that is CNS irradiation, versus uh, any other therapy. So in this case, actually, CNS radiation, we were a little worried. She was in her late 20s and we were worried about memory loss and other issues. So actually, in fact, she went for more of a um, uh, kind of a experimental regimen where uh, she was only treated with the antivirals along with rituximab. She in fact uh, contacted the person who did the trial uh, on CNS restricted lymphomas and then she started this treatment. So in this process one of the first things we did in this patient was to hold, decrease the immunosuppression and stop MMF tacrolimus we came down uh, on the steroids to a very low dose. So that was the first thing we did because obviously the extra immunosuppression she had already received in the last one year had probably contributed to her risk of developing the malignancy. The second thing we did was uh, start her on this uh, immunosuppressive regimen. Uh, she did develop severe infections post this and uh, some of the problems we faced while she was getting valgancyclovir and other things was a very low count which we were facing for a long time so we kept ha having to adjust these things and by, I, I mean, uh, I wouldn't call it luck but essentially she became negative and now she is free of malignancy. Can she, can she be retransplanted? What do you, what do you think? Uh, so she does want to be retransplanted and I think there is uh, uh, enough data to say that we can retransplant patients who have been treated with PTLD. Uh, so one of the things, uh, in fact, uh, when I was also going through literature for this particular uh, panel, um, uh, there is uh, a case report even uh, from India where they have uh, transplanted a patient post uh, PTLD. So the first question is when do we transplant these patients? So that's actually quite unclear. Uh, so the British transplant guidelines say that uh, at least one year after they become negative for malignancy, um, uh, some, sometimes up to uh, around 90 months is acceptable uh, to retransplant these patients. 
The second is uh, EBV negative uh, status at the time of the second transplant generally helps um, to avoid a recurrence. The third is what type of induction agent are we going to use? So um, I think the uh, largest uh, kind of st center studies which were done, uh, they uh, basically used uh, basiliximab. But also in thymo-naive patients in the first transplant, they actually re-challenged them with thymo. And there was not much of a recurrence in the second transplant. Uh, the other is the antiviral prophylaxis which we have to give, uh, which basically reduces the risk by more than 80%. And uh, um, anecdotally, even a nephrectomy uh, gives a better chance of not having EBV, I mean not having PTLD post-transplant. Uh, I have done one transplant in a patient who recovered from PTLD one year after she was in remission and she has finished more than three years. She's doing well. There is no recurrence. I have yet to write it. Uh, so before I hand over to the chairperson, I just want to do a quick poll. Uh, in the audience, how many of you are seeing more than, let's say, five cases per week of oncology consults for nephro? I saw Kaya in the audience. That's why I am saying for nephro. So one, two, two, two. So that, that's, that gives you an indication of how relatively new this uh, uh, field is for all of us. Uh, when the chairperson, so you want to? Uh, Anand, you are there, okay. All of us, yeah, we do get a lot of consults, predominantly for the contrast CT scans. But what I generally feel is nowadays we have a low threshold to agree for a contrast. CT. In fact, there's a, yeah, we have a very low threshold to uh, accept for a CT scan uh, compared to what discussion we have had earlier in the panel discussion. So we, uh, some of this uh, concept of contrast-induced nephropathy is believed to be something like a ghost kind of thing, which really doesn't exist these days. So if the benefit is more out of doing the investigations, we do clear and uh, go ahead with it. Because many a times we find neurologists are also not comfortable with the MRI findings or uh, maybe it's not, uh, the anatomy is not well delineated for that. I think the surgeons should be able to comment on that. I think I'll just add to that and then in a nutshell it's risk versus benefit and you know you are dealing with a patient uh, who's uh, having a malignancy which is life threatening. So I think contrast induced nephropathy should, should be, be the least, least of, of our yeah, worries at that point of time worries. because a lot is going to depend on that imaging. So I, I agree with you on that. So contrast nephropathy more of a fear for to the, for the non-nephrologists, yeah. hardly yeah, yeah. any nephrologist fears it's, a contrast. It's the radiologist who is more concerned. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, if, if, I had, uh, if I had to extend uh, uh, Dr. Sanjeev's, you know, poll or the survey, uh, with the rising number of oncology, dedicated oncology centers across the country, both in the private as well as the government setup, uh, would uh, you think that there is either a need to have an onconephrology training during, a uh, dedicated onconephrology training, either during the nephrology training or maybe after that as a fellowship? I mean, have we, uh, is that going to be a good preparedness for the future or you think that is uh, too much? Uh, maybe we can have a raise of hands on that as well. Yes, much more enthusiastic Looks response. Like a, much more enthusiastic uh, response. Uh, 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 so you uh, wanted to say something. Sir. You, yeah. One common area of interface between oncology and nephrology is carcinoma cervix. We have obstructive uropathy. What is your take on managing these patients who come with advanced uh, malignancy, obstructions, renal failure? What is the approach that you have? Once upon a time that we were taught it's all pessimism. You don't even offer them dialysis. And advanced malignancy was considered as a contraindication, ethical contraindication to starting dialysis, maintenance dialysis. So what is the modern perspective that you have? So, uh, you know, one thing is, sir, that the treatment modality, the primary treatment modality for carcinoma cervix predominantly is a combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy now. We have moved from surgery. It has not shown to be uh, oncologically better. And you are right, majority of these patients uh, come with obstructive uropathy. The typical pathway is that we would deobstruct them with nephrostomies. Uh, we will let them undergo the treatment and at some point of time internalize these nephro nephrostomies. But these obstructive uropathies keep uh, bothering later on also because now 
there is probably a radiation related structure also that these patients have to uh, battle so yes it is a it is a problem uh, interestingly the role of the urologist uh, in these patients can go decades beyond because they also happen to be the uh, commonest set of patients presenting with radiation cystitis and hematuria which is refractory to various things we have in tata we have a huge pool of these patients from all pelvic malignancies largely from ca cervix which present with even decades after so they like free of cancer for 10 years 11 years and now they have landed up into a situation where they need a salvage hysterectomy because the hematuria is refractory so that's another big and they generally they would present with hematuria and obstructive uropathy together uh, a couple of comments you mentioned regarding uh, doing a routine uh, renogram so you know when the creatinine is around two or more renogram is of no use actually dt renogram so i think a simple routine uh, ultrasound every four to six months would have helped in the first case talking of the first case so yes, renogram sir. would not help in any case because it doesn't uh, show anything when the creatinine is more than two the routine normal renogram secondly i mean uh, the third case no, i mean most of the PTLDs are B cell, B cell PTLDs, but a very small percentage, maybe about 10% are T cell as well. And we reported recently one T cell PTLD, okay. so which obviously would have the different uh, treatment options would change. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Now, we discussed about the radio contrast, which is used for CT scans and all that. But now, last week only I had a patient who was having neurological problems, something the new lesion was seen on the MRI the routine MRI, but they wanted a contrast MRI, gadolinium contrast. The best creatine was 2.5 for this patient, he's 80 year gentleman, and they needed a contrast so that they can prognosticate this patient. 18. So at GFR of 22, okay. Yeah, I, I just confirmed the age, okay. Age, age 80 years, so okay. now at age of 80 years when the GFR is 22 ml, gadolinium is indicated for prognostication, so what should we do? So I think uh, regarding contrast induced voice yeah. Yeah. yeah regarding contrast induced i think as everybody has pointed out it is more of a fear as far as contrast for ct is concerned is more of a fear uh, and you will be surprised in in pj even this days we are getting referral for clearance in a dialysis like patient who is already end stage renal disease on dialysis going for ct and radiologist is simply sending for nephrology clearance so one reason is that they are overburdened and they just want to shunt the patient off and another reason is obviously the ignorance so i think this is more of a fear and i think this should be uh, more discussed in radiology community rather than a nephrology community that whether contrast induced nephropathy exists or not but regarding gadolinium i think nobody doubts that gadolinium induced toxicity does agree does exist and any gfr of less than 30 is a contraindication uh, as far as the guidelines are concerned but as was discussed earlier you have to weigh risk versus benefit and if you think that you are short short requiring this thing and without that you you, know, you can't even manage your patient then i am not sure so, but because also if you go by guidelines it is 30 gfr specifically 80 years even if he gets nfs nsf we are talking about what eight nine years down the road i mean the evaluation and prognostication now versus nsf nine years down the road but if you see the literature in uh, in this patient, the only thing i think you should be worried about is medical legally just informing yeah. them that this is the risk and it's down the road and go ahead and do it i, no, don't, but I, don't I think know there is some uh, debate regarding this in the recent many recent uh, conferences that with the newer uh, agents which have mri contrast agents it's probably a myth now even that's what yeah even even yeah, saying. that that is so also there one can you know balance the risk yeah i think there is yeah. too much of fear and it's too much of fear. Real life uh, issues which we have encountered with GADO. Sick. But medical legal, yes, that uh, problem. I also wanted to share one interesting because uh, I, uh, somebody has asked about CA service. We had a lupus, uh, lupus nephritis patient, and this patient was managed with immunosuppression, was a refractory disease. And then uh, she was like 60 years with refractory disease, and suddenly she had uh, bleeding per vaginum and diagnosed to have CA cervix. Uh, without any obstructive uropathy or uh, so re renal biopsy proven lupus nephritis so this patient was managed with uh, uh, radiation oncology people and given radiation 
and by giving radiation, this lupus nephritis went into remission. Oh, oh. And this patient is off immunosuppression since last five years. We have actually published uh, this case also. Very interesting. Like just by giving radiation, the lupus was also taken care of. So this is also one of the interaction which you can find between oncologists and nephrologists. It is not one way road. It can, you, it can be both ways. Given, given that we've moved from onco-nephrology to contrast-induced nephropathy, I think we should close this session now. Uh, and sir, 10 minutes ahead of time. Yeah, thank you so much. Which is why we made you the moderator. Thank you.